Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Atomic Mass Transmissions Live. I'm Will Schick, Director of Product Development for Atomic Mass Games. I'm excited to be joining with you as we kick off our week of streaming, because today we are going to be putting paint on the fantabulous, the gross, the scaly, the lizard. That's right. Coming up uh, in this month's release for the Spider-Man wave, we have Amazing Spider-Man, Black Cat, Craven. Uh, we're going to be kicking things off with the lizard. We did paint Mysterio uh, and Carnage a little while ago. I know Dallas has some things in store as well for Thursday at 1 p.m. Pacific. Uh, so be sure to be tuning in for all that good stuff. And, of course, we have our roster challenge from last May. We're still going to be playing that game as soon as our studio is set up and ready to go uh, for some sweet gaming action. With that said, let me get this camera off of me onto the star of our show, The Lizard, so we can get to painting because there's a lot of work that we want to get done on this fella. All right. So you can see that I have approached this through our normal means. I just used the Zenith Prime uh, technique where I did a dark coat of gray. I did a light coat of gray over the top to give us some nice shading and definition to work from. And we're just going to dive in. My goal here today is to kind of replicate a very classic lizard look. Uh, I have a bunch of different greens to play with the scales. So we're just going to like mess around here. So I have Undead Flesh. Whoop, let's get it on camera. I've got Misfits Green. I have Mem Green. And uh, I assume that's short for like membrane. I don't know. And then I have this Rift Green here. So I'm going to be using a whole bunch of different mixes on the greens. We're just going to try to come up with something that kind of feels like comic booky lizard skin. I don't really have a plan for this. Uh, when it comes to the lab coat and the pants, though, we have definitely um, some strong opinions and thoughts on that. We're going to be replicating, again, kind of the classic comic book color. So we're going to look for that white lab coat. We're going to look for... Uh, <clears throat> The purple pants, we're gonna go purple pants today, that classic lizard look. And then if we have time, we'll dive into the water and we'll kind of approach that. We'll see if we can make some muddy sewer water. So just to start, I've just thinned out, this is gonna be the uh, mem green. And so we're just gonna start applying this all over the scales. I thinned it out a bit, but I'm not really using it as a wash because there's so much texture here. My plan uh, is gonna to be to do uh, a normal kind of shade wash on this and then we're going to start adding in some other colors and just kind of maybe do a little dry brushing and stuff we want we want a lot of different variations and uh, we really want that texture to kind of play through let's see here so again i thin this out not to quite a wash consistency but i did i did thin it out a little bit a little wiggle it looks like my water glue came a little loose here that's okay. We'll get it fixed. So you can see that this mem green has a lot of yellow to it. It's a very yellow green, almost like an olive. And that yellowness is going to give us that nice color. We can shade it up with like a blue green wash, maybe from the Misfits green. Um, we can add in a bunch of other colors. We might be able to add in a little purple just to tie it in with the pants as well. So we've got a lot of, we've got a lot of places to play on this. And we can just kind of continue to mess with it. And again, because we're looking for a more natural kind of true lizard skin, having that modeling pattern, not having all the colors be consistent, it's just going to help everything look more realistic uh, to a point. But we're also going to use punchy colors. So we did pick, we'd pick out colors that are nice and poppy, really saturated. Again, that yellow green is going to be really helpful. So I know BK posted the lizard's card. A stat card up this morning. People have had a chance to take a look at it and see what this guy does. Uh, working on him was definitely a fun experience. Um, he is he was just from the very start kind of meant to be the spider foes tank. You know, we really wanted to emphasize the lizard from the comics where he has that regeneration, that healing factor. Obviously, Kirk Connors trying to grow back his arm. It's a big whole reason as to why he becomes a big scary man lizard in the first place. Um, but we wanted to do a character that could just sit on a point and effectively uh, just soak damage like a sponge. Uh, so not a not a ton of offensive potential from uh, Lizard. And that wasn't, wasn't his role as defined. You know, with three points, you kind of, you fall into different kind of categories. Um, he's certainly, I think, one of the most durable three-pointers in the game uh, between healing factor and, of course, uh, his ability to reduce damage suffered by one to a minimum of one with his scaly hide. I think it's scaly hide, thick hide, something like that. 
with his scales, you know. Um, and then, of course, he has pretty good stamina uh, as well, especially on the healthy side, which really matters when you're trying to sit on points and hold on to him. The uh, biochemical breakthrough, which allows him to throw up to size three, is also pretty special uh, when it comes to a three coster. Normally, they're, you know, a lot of the times, most of those characters at that cost are reduced to uh, only being able to throw size two. So he's he's definitely got some stuff going for him. His drawbacks, of course, like we talked about, uh, he's he's not really meant to be a bruiser. So his his initial attack is got a really great push. The tail whip um, definitely has uh, a lot of tie into what he wants to do, which is to just control points, get people off of him, and then sit there and be a problem. So he's got the wild push, which is pretty solid. Uh, it does only roll four dice. There are ways, of course, through team tact cards and others that you can like really incentivize that if you want to. Like overall, um, there are many other characters on Spider Foes that are designed to be the bruisers of the squad. And we didn't want to put too many. You know, you've got Carnage, you've got Venom, the Green Goblin when he flips to his more aggressive injured size, all that stuff. Uh, why do we paint different colors? Well, you know, a lot of the reasons are uh, the art and the miniatures happen at different times, but also on concurrent tracks. And, uh, you know, much like comic books in general, we let the creatives, uh, we let the creative folks kind of pick reference and do what they feel like is going to make the best composition. So, you know, looking at all the different references out there, yeah, Lizard's pants have been classically purple, but he's definitely worn a lot of different colors of pants. He's had brown trousers. He's definitely had the blue trousers like uh, Brendan Roy painted and the reference that we provided to them. So we keep it pretty free. Uh, I don't think that anything is lost by a little bit of inconsistency or uh, color choices. And I think it's inspiring. You know, again, you can paint them just like you remember them from the comics or from your favorite run. But you can also go in and, I mean, if you want your lizard to be blue or uh, maybe you want it to be like chameleon colored, you can absolutely do that too. And I think that's part of the fun. So we don't take a very hard line like, this is the colors of this character in this world. It's like, yeah, you know, we do comic accurate stuff and we pull from a variety of different uh, creative teams and runs and all that. And a lot of the times the artists uh, help us choose different color palettes for different mediums. And you'll notice even on the tactic cards, you know, our artistic style for one are not all the same. That's very intentional. Uh, you know, we want to kind of like go through the range of different comic styles and art interpretations and stuff because comics have such a wide breadth of creative talents and, and looks and different eras and all that. And then, of course, at the same time, like I said, everything's kind of being worked on at different spaces and stuff. <laughs> will, will Lizard have a tactical let him see move anywhere on the board? Uh, I, I don't want to, I don't want to give out any unofficial spoilers because I know BK is in the, in the wings watching, but I will say, no, there's no sewer card. Um, he does have some pretty cool tactic cards that are specific to him. Uh, and, uh, or at least influenced by him, I guess I should say. Um, so he does bring some cool extra kit to the table if you want to choose to utilize your tactic cards in that way. Uh, but there's no, currently there's no sewer card. So, you don't, have to, you don't have to continue to worry about that or speculate on what that might be. Um, okay, I'm pretty happy with where this green is laying down. So I think we're going to go in. He does have a tactic card called Monkey Brain is Lizard Home. And it's amazing. Uh, you can thank one Josh Cologne for that. He was very insistent that we make a team tactic card with that title. Um and so, so we did, so we did. I'm gonna take a little bit of green ink and a little bit of blue ink, and I'm gonna mix that together because uh, blue is a great shade for green. Honestly, as we've talked about before, blue can really shade anything. It's so potent and punchy. Um, so I just wanna kind of make like a nice deep shade. And then I'm going to 
thin it down pretty good because I don't want to tint the top. I just kind of want this to really flow into the cracks and crevices on the on the scales. Give us that nice pop and definition. Any hints about monkey brain? Oh my gosh. I don't know. Somebody on somebody on chat would have to do that. That would have to be a BK call. I'm sure there's an article that's going to be coming soon that will detail both Lizard and Craven's uh, team tactic cards. Craven also has a couple of very cool uh, specific team tactic cards that he brings to the table with him and that also fill out some spider foe stuff. But there's a there's a whole lot of there's a whole lot of cool things that are coming and obviously BK has his articles and all of that. Don't want to step on those toes, but um, if you're worried about offensive damage potential and you want a little bit more out of out of Lizard and you wanna and you have a spot on team tactics on your team tactics slot for that, I don't think you'll be disappointed with the monkey brain one. Um, it certainly gives him a nice little extra punch that he can utilize at the right time to really come in clutch, especially after maybe he gets dazed or uh, takes a big hit or has a big spike on his dice kind of stuff. I'll make the difference. Oh, there you go. See? Tom Mass Games just giving away all of it. Yeah, it's a nice little area attack at five dice. It's a great, it's a great little addition. Uh, it's similar in kind of style and scope to Lethal Protector for Venom, which obviously gives Venom some extra mobility when he's somewhat limited outside of his pulls and his pushes. Um, his web snare. So. A lot of the times we like to bake in uh, some all extra options that players can use, and especially when it just expands kind of the scope of what these characters can do on the table and what to expect from them. Of course, there's opportunity cost for it as well. But we've also talked a little bit about uh, design philosophy in general on things like mini extravaganza and stuff like that, but it is a really big kind of consideration for us. To make sure that going forward, we kind of focus more team tact cards in a little more narrow fashion, a bit more of a focus. Okay, I think I'm gonna let that green wash dry and then we'll come back to it and mess around with it later. Uh, so let's go ahead and start on, do the pants, I think. For that. All right, so I'm going to be using for the pants. I'm going to use uh, Scale 75's Violet. This is from the basic range. This I am going to thin down uh, into kind of like the more wash consistency. And then we'll just start applying this to the pants. This is going to come out pretty lavender lavendery. There we go. Lavendery to start. Um, but we'll shade it down with some blue washes and maybe some violet ink tents in there too. Or maybe we'll leave it because we'll just like the more pastel -y color of the pants. I find that this violet really washes down, waters down really nicely. Uh, it's got a lot of pigment to it and a pretty good punch. That's how I did my Medusa suit uh, when we were painting up the Inhumans at the start of the year. And so I've gone back to this color a number of times when I want something to wash over a Zenith Prime uh, because I find that it just thins out really nice. It pools pretty well. It gives a nice color saturation. It's really contrasty and can make painting stuff like this really quick with great results. And that's what we're always looking for. Yeah, the, the utilizing the team tactic cards for like specific team ups and big movie, like big cinematic moments and that kind of stuff, or providing a bit of an alternate or additional play style uh, or quote unquote tactic, I guess. Um, haha, look at that. Four characters to utilize. 
uh, and again, given that opportunity cost of you only get so many team tactic cards, uh, you know, not every game is going to see every situation pop up where that team tactic card is going to be 100% effective. Really lets us kind of like uh, bring it out. Oh my gosh. Are you asking me Atomic Mass games? Because I might be able to guess properly what Craven's fearful symmetry team tactic card does <laughs> which i have said before and i'll say again is easily my favorite team tactic card we might have ever made uh, and it has in no way shape or form any bearing on the fact that it is pagani's least favorite team tactic card that we've ever made <laughs> i would never do that i would never have a spite pick uh, Fearful Symmetry is just, I just love the zaniness and the narrative like scope of that card and how it really opens up um, our ability to bring those amazing and often talked about cinematic moments, those special comic book moments to the fore and the table. All right, Purple Pants, nailed. Look at that. So beautiful. Let's work, let's work on the uh, lab coat. You know, the other thing that I don't know is I don't know what color we want his shirt to be. So we should figure that out. Because he's got these shirt tatters going on. It looks like maybe black. So maybe we'll do that. All right. Oh, Tarnium. I like, I like your thoughts. I like your thinking here. Um... It does have something very nefarious to do with Craven and Spider-Man. That's true. Fearful Symmetry does, just like the storyline. Okay. Um, so I'm going to move on to the white coat. The way I'm going to start this is I'm going to use some rainy gray. I'm going to mix that rainy gray in with a little bit of um, snow white, I think. Just one of the various whites, the not pure whites, but the slightly off whites. Um, from scale, and we're just going to start knocking in this color, and we're going to do a base coat, and then we're going to start building in stuff as we go. And then we're going to have to dingy up this coat, because this man just jumped out of a sewer. So if we have the time, which I think we will, once we get our whites all done, we'll go in with our bravery chest, and we'll start really... Uh, really grossing it out will give it a lot of gross speckles and splotches and stuff because there's no way this thing came out clean from the sewers now one of the things that you could do is you could water this down and kind of use it as an initial shade over the coat um, and that would help speed everything up as well if you wanted to do it that way, take down some of that light and see if that gets some of the glow off now that we're working with whites. Just adjust a little bit so you can see what's going on. You can see here, this part is supposed to be glued to this part so it doesn't wobble, but it came loose. Uh, but I don't want to get super glue on my paintbrush, so I'm not going to fix it right now. So if he does wobble, just know because this piece right here should be glued to this piece, but it looks like my glue didn't set. So that's okay. It does happen from time to time. All right, so and I think that taking down that light source just a little bit helps the camera not be blown out now that we're working in really light colors. So again, this is kind of just going to be our base here. And then from there, we'll start. We'll do one really quick shade down, and then we'll start building up the white. And this will help it look a little dingy and gross, like it's old and used. He's not fresh out of the lab. He's been, he's been wandering around the sewers. He hasn't washed this coat in a while, all that stuff. All right. Oh, I like all of this. I like all of this 
really reasonable uh, guessing that's happening on Fearful, Fearful Symmetry. I mean, at this point, I feel like BK just has to let me show the card at some point. If he's going to continue to taunt you about it and make you guess, it seems only fair. Because I don't think anyone's going to guess. No one, no one in their right mind, as Pagani would say, would come up with this. Okay. I think we're pretty good. If I can't see it, my brush can't get to it, no one else is going to see it either, so I'm not going to worry too much about the inner side. Okay, so we have a nice little foundation for what's going on. I mean, there's so many ways to tackle the water. You can do you can do a more classic blue water. You can do a really dingy brown-green water, which I think is my kind of go-to right now. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of flat gray. I'm going to mix that into my base just to create a quick shade. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to water that down just a little bit so it's nice and nice and flowy. Not quite a wash, but pretty close. You could do this as a wash if you wanted to. I want a little more control over it. And I might even go so far as to like feather it out. So come in and we're just gonna work in a little bit of this, a little bit of that over here it's true you got to go bigger though chat you got to go bigger so remember when painting white for those who haven't heard us say it like five million times uh, or for those who need a refresher white is all about the shadows so it when you're painting white paint as little pure white as possible because that's not what the eye sees uh, if you start to really examine white and what you view as white, you're going to notice, and this is especially true in like art pieces and paintings and stuff, it's always a different color. It's white mixed with something else. And usually that something else is really, really heavy in the shadows. And then the white only really becomes white on the very top. <laughs> um, so like here, I'm using... I'm using this rainy gray, which has a little bit of green to it. Um, you could use like a purple, a yellow, all different kinds of, of options here. Let's really break it down. I'm gonna go a little bit darker in those shadows. Yeah, see, so if you paint a lot of white, you start to really understand. And then like the biggest thing for me was A, getting to kind of work with Dallas and have him talk a lot about the theory and philosophy of whites, which he does a lot. Um, but also, I read an article, and it was about kind of like the fundamentals of white. It was specifically focused on hobby miniatures painting, which is why I was reading it in the first place. But it used a whole bunch of like real world art examples um, where it really illustrated and, and showed how, you know, saying that, well, the white in this picture is actually just it's actually just yellow with a little bit of white highlight on top. And I was like, holy cow, they're not joking. Look at all that yellow. Um, so it can, make a, it can make a really big difference. So I'm just kind of like going in, add a little more flat black to the colors. Um, I'm gonna actually use that for the underside here as well. Although honestly, no one's ever gonna see that, so. <laughs> I could probably get away without painting it at all. But I'm just gonna go ahead and slap a little bit of color on there. Just to tie it in a bit more, cause I'll know, I'll know it's there. And then, once we like, so I'm just kind of looking for like the really deep folds or recesses like here under the collar, which would be a little darker, that kind of stuff. Um, under the shoulder. And so we're looking really gray now, but we're gonna go back through and we will start highlighting back up. And as we do that, we should start to get a nice 
little lab coat white going on. And this is by far the longest probably portion of this mini is just doing the white, so. Oh man, this has really become quite the guessing game here. Got all kinds of stuff going on. Okay, I'm gonna use a little bit of, I'm gonna go back to the scan or the scales. I'm gonna use some undead flesh. I'm gonna mix that with my merm green. Uh, and we're just gonna start highlighting up. And messing around with some stuff. The reason that I chose the uh, undead flesh is because it's a nice kind of blue green white because it's supposed to, it's you know obviously it's supposed to be used on necrotic flesh and such. Um, so it mixes really well with the yellow greens that we're kind of using on the scales. And I'm just going to come in and now what I'm really doing. It's just kind of like tapping this color in uh, in a pretty rough pattern. I'm not, I'm not necessarily trying to do anything consistent. Again, we want this to look semi-realistic and natural. And so we're going for that modeling kind of leather or lizard skin patterning. And that means that actually being symmetric, we should be afraid of symmetry. Oh, we pulled it all back around BK. It's like we planned it from the beginning. But we definitely want to avoid symmetry because um, this kind of coloration, these skin patternings and things, they wouldn't really kind of have that going on. So all I'm doing is I'm just kind of taking the brush and I'm very gently tapping. And the texture of the skin is so nice and detailed that it almost works a little bit like a dry brush in that if I'm really gentle with my taps, the color picks up on the raised scales and it avoids the crevices. And so I can get some really nice highlighting results without too much muss or fuss. And of course, it's almost like a stipple a really controlled stipple. Um, and then of course I'm building up texture by kind of stabbing, by smooshing the paint onto the mini itself. And so this is, I think this is part of the real fun of like lizard and then other creatures that have scales or thick, highly uh, textured hides is that you can really start playing with some of this stuff and these different techniques. You get a lot of freedom and leeway. You could dry brush this for sure if you wanted to dry brush. There is one called Necrogenic Recombinator. It's true. All right. That one definitely plays into Lizard's more uh, focus on durability and such. Come over this tail. Like something big like this tail, it might even be better to do more of a traditional dry brush because um, it would just go faster. But we're here and I don't have a dry brush or a textured palette or towel to dry brush on. So we're just gonna do it this way. So a lot like dry brushing, you wanna make sure that this highlight is pretty punchy. It's pretty, uh, you know, you're not looking for like small changes in value or tone, that kind of stuff. You want, you want something that's gonna immediately stand out. And again, it's just utilizing it sparingly and if we go too too far we can always come back okay with that done i'm going to take a little bit more of my undead flesh 
and we're just going to come in. This is going to be almost pure undead flesh now. Ooh, Tarnium, you are you are barking up so much the right tree here. So much the right tree. I will say the one the one flaw the one flaw in your guess here is that uh, we don't like having people take ownership of other people's miniatures. Because it's all cool when you know the person, but you know there are definitely people that I would trust using the miniatures that I spent all this time painting, and there are definitely people who I don't know well enough to let them put hands on my stuff. So we're we're like I would say eighty percent there. Working through it. We're getting crazy. This is what we were missing. We needed we needed more craziness. Tarnium's giving it to us. Just gonna keep blasting stuff through. I mean, in the fearful symmetry comet line, Craven did take over as Spider-Man. So again, Tarnium's uh, current guess is so close. There's just a couple. The little things. Now, if we wanted to, we could come back through with like maybe some some darker brown, maybe an umber, mix it in with our green. Okay, a little bit of green modeling to this fellow, or brown, green brown. Deepen that up. That would help give him more of a realistic kind of alligator hide. It's so obviously this more saturated, vibrant green that we have here, while still trying to replicate the more realistic kind of modeling pattern and stuff, is probably a little too colorful for most of reality. And you'll notice that I didn't really go back through and hit any of these rips and tears because I think they're pretty good all right. You're cold. You're warm. You're cold. I didn't know we were playing this game today. I feel like we should have had sound effects for this, BK. All right. I'm pretty happy with this lizard skin. That's looking pretty good. I'm going to go and add a little bit of... A bleach bone to it to bring it up one more level and do those super zingy highlights. And these ones we're going to want to be pretty careful with because it's going to be very punchy. So we're just going to come in. And again, same idea. This time I'm just looking for like the most raised points though. And these are kind of going to be like little zings of light. So kind of on the knuckles, a little bit on the arm. Uh, the trick with this one, and something that I always struggle with, is less is going to be more when it comes to this super punchy like ultra highlight. So... I just want to use it pretty sparingly. Because if we use too much, we'll lose all of our undercolors. And this is similar to how the white's going to work in that. The highlight, if it becomes too potent, will kind of take over everything. And it will become the color of the eye sees, and we'll lose that saturation. Because this is pretty desaturated now. Um, 
because of the colors that we've mixed in. So we want to maintain that nice shiny green, nice comic booky green here. But we do want to give those little added zings of highlight. It's going to make all that texture and the volumes on this mini just really come to life and look really good. And so again, you could do this with dry brushing. One of the things that could be really fun to do is if you wanted to give them kind of a, uh, like a banding pattern or some kind of like mottled texture, you come up with a different color and you could start adding that stuff in. And I have my second blending brush always available. So as I start to add this stuff in on the tail, if I feel like I'm going a little too heavy, come in and I can blend it back out. I can smooth out the texturing a little bit. Make sure that it works the way that I want it to. Here, especially where I think that light's gonna be. A really quick, fun, fast way to get some nice looking lizardy scales. Go a little bit. And then, of course, if you go too, too far, you can, of course, bring everything back down with like a nice little glaze. So you do your green glaze or blue glaze or anything like that. <gasps> All right, I think we're pretty happy. I'm pretty happy with where that skin is. It's looking really nice. Our white looks to be dry, so let's go ahead and dive back in. Start painting that white lab coat. So again, I'm gonna go back to that rainy gray. I'm gonna mix in a bit of white with it. So I'm gonna take pure white this time. So we are going to highlight up to a pure white. But I want to make sure that I always have that rainy gray kind of as the base in there. So if there's a progression of colors that exists in a paint line that you already like that kind of walks through the different whites and gray, you can absolutely use that too. A big thing is going to be to make sure that this color stays nice and smooth and flows really well. Pure white's often get very, very uh, thick. Start coming through. Building up these whites. So I just begin the process of kind of like layer highlighting up, doing a little bit of blending where we need to. Start taking these colors. Cloth. So this is almost gonna this is gonna be a really big, almost like another base coat in a way, after all the shading we did. But because the paint is gonna be kind of translucent, especially with the thinner nests we're doing, it's it's not quite a glaze, it's not quite a transparency, you don't want that. You could do it that way if you had the patience and the time, you could build up the whites through translucencies and stuff. Um, and that would definitely work. But that's not quite what we're going for here. We do want we do want this to flow really nice though. And we do want those undertones to show through and all that good stuff. So it's just gonna help get everything going. Oh, well maybe BK, after all of this amazing guessing and everyone being such a good sport, we can go, we can go to the tape, we can go to the card. 
I have it. I have it here in my binder, my reference binder. So we'll see what BK says. Maybe this is the day I didn't know I was waiting for the whole time. The day when the world will know. <gasps> Let's go to the tape. But my white, you're gonna have to wait. I gotta do this white first. Then we'll go to the tape. We got 20 minutes. I promise I'll show it. Hang with me. I don't wanna, I don't wanna have mixed this color in vain. <laughs> that would be really strong if you could replace a three threat Craven with a five threat Spider Man. That would be pretty nutso. All right, so we're just going to continue to build these colors up. You can see how I'm mostly aiming for the raised areas when I get into the shadows. That's when I'll go to my blending brush and I'll kind of like blend it into the recesses. And so that lets us be really nice with the color. This big flat area will kind of just go over it a little bit like an overbrush. Come back in, grab that blending brush. Blend out those little sections of shadow so that we maintain our differentiation and colors and such. Over here, down here. I'm just going to pull that white color all the way over from where we place it. Again, kind of paint with a little bit of transparencies. Let me pull that color out. Alright. Pretty happy with that. I think we're looking pretty good. Building up some nice dingy white here. It's class. And the biggest trick, again, is watch your paint. Make sure that it stays nice and smooth um, because the more white, the more pure white you add, the more quickly it might chunk up on you and then you're gonna start losing that smoothness that you really want to make sure that your blends and everything are looking really nice. Okay. I think I'm pretty happy with that. So we can take a pause and grab my binder and we'll see what Fearful Symmetry does. <laughs> Stretch. Do, 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 do. We'll just have some fun. We'll show off the artwork at least for all three of the cards we've talked about. So here we go. So here's the art for Necrogenic Recombinator. So you see Connor's doing something terrible to that poor lizard. He's just trying to be good. Here is Monkey Brain is Lizard Home. This piece is just so crazy and so vibrant. And here is Fearful Symmetry. Astute observers will notice uh, that it's a little bit different than the classic comic book uh, cover. Craven is in the classic Spider-Man suit. So here we go. So this card says, when Craven the Hunter KOs an enemy, Peter Parker. If there's no Peter Parker in your squad, Craven the Hunter may play this card. 
Craven the Hunter transforms into Spider-Man Peter Parker. No amazing Spider-Man. You replace Craven the Hunter's stat card with Spider-Man's Peter Parker's stat card with its healthy side up. Move all damage tokens, power, special condition, objective tokens, and effect from Craven the Hunter to Spider-Man Peter Parker. Spider-Man Peter Parker is now part of your squad. Yes, Spider-Man Peter Parker would mean not amazing Spider-Man Peter Parker. So there you go. So that's Fearful Symmetry. So if you ever wanted to live the dream, KO an enemy Spider-Man Peter Parker with your Craven the Hunter and then play this card, you would get yourself a Spider-Man Peter Parker. It is by far my favorite of the cards that we have made because it is so flavorful and silly and fun. And when you pull it off, it feels amazing. But it's also just one of those things where like, you know, how practical is it? I don't know. Probably not that much. But I don't think, you know, a lot of the times we don't play these games for practical. We play them for the stories. We play them for the excitement of it happening. Maybe you keep this in your, in your, you know, tactic card pile. And that one time you're like, oh, my opponent is bringing web warriors. And I guarantee you they're going to take Spider-Man Peter Parker and I'm going to take Craven, and I'm going to live this dream and we're going to make it amazing and it's going to happen. And it does. And that's a story that you tell uh, forever because it's amazing. And your opponent gets to tell that story and all that stuff. And it's just one of those things that's so evocative of the comics that the game is based off of. And the storylines, you know, Fearful Symmetry. You look up best Spider-Man runs and storylines or Marvel storylines in general. And Fearful Symmetry is always somewhere in those lists in the top. It was one that we knew we had to do. We just had to do it. And... The more ridiculous it got, just the more right it felt. So there you go. Now you know. The secret's out. Well, I mean, if you're going by the actual uh, storyline, of course, it would be not the symbiote suit, but, you know, Craven wore the black Spider-Man costume based off of the symbiote suit. Um However, because we thought that might get a little confusing, we did take the liberty and we we shuffled it so that it was more the classic Peter Parker from the core set, because that's the one that we had made the most sense for people to transform into. So it's a little different. There's a little twist on it, you know, like everything. Uh, we made it conform properly to the game and, and what was available. But I think that if you were going to hobby your own Spider-Man, for the eventual nature of turning your Craven into Spider-Man, you would absolutely, I would absolutely do the the symbiote inspired black suit for that mini, 100%. Because then it would be accurate to the storyline and the cover and all that good stuff. All right, so we're just like blocking in some higher white highlights now. Really getting down to it. Filling up those whites. So that we start to really mimic the appearance of that white lab coat. Just kind of blending all that stuff through. So we're keeping everything nice and smooth again. You can see how we have yet to paint with actually pure white, but we're really getting to the point where it feels like this lab coat is a very true white. And that's all due to how we've built up our layers and the minimal amount of pure white highlights that we've gotten to so far. I think our next step will just be to go to an almost pure white and just very, very carefully sketch out some scritches and lines and highlights so that we have that nice color going on.
And having that blending brush will definitely help smooth everything out, let those colors work together. We really play well. But the trick is the, you know, again, just like highlighting in general, but especially here, the brighter you go, the less you want to do. Because if you do too much, you're going to start to lose that effect and it's going to start to look less, less correct. especially in these shadow areas here. Or the cape kind of, or the, the cloak gets a little bit further down into shadow. We can just kind of blend out some of that white from the side. Let's see, it would keep our, our nice little like differentiation in colors. It'll look fairly correct because our light source is of course always on the top that noonday sun that we love so much. So we're not doing any kind of OSL. Okay, so now I just wanna go through. And I'm not even gonna add necessarily more white. I just wanna come through and build a little bit of extra layer to some of these ridges and highlights because the paint is transparent. Sometimes it doesn't take adding more of your highlight color to your mix. It just takes another pass, especially if you're working with thinner, smoother colors. The more you add, the more opaque you're gonna make it. So this is kind of the strength of working in transparencies as well, is that you have a lot of control over the final look of that highlight because it takes more coats, yes, but you can build up that color slowly to reach a point that you're happy with. So that's what we're kind of doing here. And it's, I think it's such a fun experience. It's similar to my love of dry brushing where the more you go over an area with a thin with a thinned out coat, the more impressive and built up the color is going to be. And so it's just kind of like magic when you get there. And again, you can use a lot of different, like you could stipple if you wanted a little bit more texture because it's cloth. It'd be kind of what I'm doing. Just letting the paint over brushing a little bit. And then of course, focusing on the areas where I see those folds and highlights, especially in areas like this, where there's a lot of, there's a lot of scrunched up detail, just doing a really quick overbrush, which is basically just a, a dry brush without scraping the brush across a texture powder or whatever will be going on. Uh, I think I'm pretty happy with where we're at with this white. So I might take one more layer of pure white in the six minutes we have left. We're gonna go almost to pure white here. And this is gonna be our most extreme highlight. And again, we wanna be very sparing with this. So I'm gonna go and add a little bit of it to like where the elbows are. Here where these folds are. So if before I was kind of following the whole line here, I'm just trying to do like the barest hint of the line. And honestly, I could do the same thing that I did on the skin. Just tap in some little dots of reflective highlight as well. I wind up getting to a spot where I didn't like it. 
can very easily fix that with my blendy brush. So as always, I can't recommend having that secondary brush ready and available because it lets you erase mistakes, which we make all the time. It helps you with your blending and bringing out these colors. Uh, Thanos good blue base color from scale depends on kind of like the blue you want if you want more of a navy blue um, like I'd have to dig let me dig here in a second once we're done with this I can like take a look Dallas if he's around Dallas might have an idea for a really good Thanos base blue as well but if you want to go like classic Thanos you're really looking for like a deep navy blue um, I'm sure they have a couple of in the different lines between the fantasy and game and then the normal blues. If you wanted to do something a little more punchy, um, of course, I'm always going to be a big fan of Holder Blue as a base. And I think Dallas might have even done his Thanos with Holder Blue as like a wash undertone. And then he put his normal blues on top of it. But I'm not entirely sure if that was the approach he took on that one. It's definitely one that would work. All right. So we got pretty good on this lizard. Made some very excellent progress. We've got plenty of things left to do, though. All blues are see they should be. Holder Blue is just a great blue. That's all there is to it. I want to add just a couple of little scritch texture lines here on the flat of this cloak, just a this coat. I keep calling it a cloak. It should be a cloak. He's a lizard monster. Lizard monsters need cloaks. All right, so I think that's an excellent looking dingy lab coat. So it's a little bit of the gray, with some really good scales. I see that I've made a mistake right here on the tail, so I'll have to go fix that up, but that won't take too long. We'll just go back in with some of the greens. I got some white on that beautiful tail, I know, but it's easy to fix, so we'll fix it up. This is just what happens. Sometimes you can even just scrape it away. Let's see if we can erase it. I bet we can erase it. Mm, 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 mm. Oh, it's coming off. We can scrub it off, I bet. We'll get there. Okay, so with that, like I said, we have a really good foundation for this lizard. He's almost tabletop ready, honestly. We could just finish the shirt if we wanted to do the tongue, the eyeballs, uh, and slap some color in the water and call this good to go. I'm going to continue to take him forward. Uh, in some different things. We should add some dirt to the cloak, all that stuff, because he's been jumping out of the sewer. There's no way that cloak would be that white, even though it's not super white. Uh, we'll do some extra coloration to the pants, do a little shading, all that stuff. So plenty more to do. Very excited. We'll get this going, uh, and we'll have a lot of fun. And then eventually we'll get this fella on the table, and it will be amazing. So thank you very much for joining me. I hope you all had fun, learned something. I uh, hope you're excited to see some of the tactic cards that come with Lizard. Thank you for playing Brian's uh, guessing game, Mr. BK, just challenging all of you to figure out what crazy things we've done. Uh, be sure to tune back in tomorrow at 1 p.m. Pacific. I will be painting uh, something. I don't know what. Haven't, haven't quite figured that out yet. But um, we're, of course, going to continue on with our hobby. Thursday, Dallas Camp will be back at 1 p.m. Pacific. Uh, he will be doing some painting on other spider Force stuff. I think he has Black Cat on the table, if I'm not mistaken. And then, of course, join John Schaefer on Friday at 1 p.m. Pacific, uh, where we'll be doing some more fun stuff as well. Until then, be good to each other, stay safe, stay beautiful, and we will see you on the next one. Thank you for joining, and goodbye.